Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hillary. I work for Mofka. So thank you for joining us. Welcome. Um, as you may or may not know, this webinar is in a series of webinars directed at beginner gardeners. So this is the fourth one that we've done this spring. They're listed on the Mofka website and are available on Mofka's YouTube channel. So you can go back and check them out. I'm really grateful today that, that we have Dave Colson from Mofka who's going to be joining us. Dave lives in Durham, Maine, and with his wife Chris runs New Leaf Farm. He's also been working with and around Mofka for many, many years on the board of directors for many years as a host for Mofka apprentices at his farm. And then um, more recently as, a, as an employee of Mofka, he was agricultural services director for, for several years and now is um, agricultural specialist for Southern Maine. I hope I got that right, Dave. And so, yeah, I'm really glad that, that Dave ha is willing to do this webinar today and, and glad that you're all joining us. Um, as you know, we're gonna be talking about July in the garden, kind of looking forward for the next month and talking about the sorts of things that you um, ought to be thinking about in your garden or the kinds of challenges that you might be facing. I'm guessing that most folks are familiar with MOFCA, um, but if you aren't, the main Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, we, we educate on organic agriculture, advocate for organic agriculture, and we try to support farmers and gardeners. So we have lots of different events, many of which are online at the moment, um, that are aimed at gardeners. Every couple of weeks, we've been having, having gardener Q&A sessions um, where the, the topics, you know, just go wherever the participants want to take the conversation. So it can be a really great way to get questions answered about what's going on in your garden. Um, and the next one, I believe, is coming up on July 1st at 7 p.m. So I'll throw a couple of links into the chat box later on um, related to these events and directing you to some other resources for gardeners that are available on the Mofka website. So I think that's everything from my end. Dave, if you want to share your screen and get started, that'd be great. There we go. Can you see that? Hopefully. So uh, Hillary mentioned this. Um, what is Mofka? Oh, oh. So uh, a few different of the things that we do, new farmer training, folks probably know us from the Common Ground Country Fair, which is a virtual event this year. Volunteers uh, generally um, help keep things going at the fair, grounds and our space in unity um, and provide a lot of help in running the fair, managing the fair. We have a separate certification agency that certifies organic farms in the state and beyond. Um, as Hillary mentioned, a lot of farmer and gardener training. Um, its formats have changed this year, but still continuing to do that. And most of our educational events are also uh, being offered virtually this year. Hopefully, we'll be able to get back to in-person educational events and the fair sometime in the future. Okay, so today's topic is July in the Garden. Um, my name's Dave Colson, and I wor have worked for Mofka for about nine years in the farmer programs uh, program of Mofka. So where are we right now with the garden? Well, we just had the summer solstice this last uh, weekend. Um, so a lot of things will be uh, changing as we move into the actual um, heat and meat of summer. Um, one of the things that you'll notice if you're watching either uh, weather forecasts or your almanac is that the days now will begin to their slow march uh, to the dark winter solstice. So we're losing a small amount of daylight this time of year. You know, the equinox is generally when that um, pace quickens. Uh, but one of the things that happens as we pass the summer solstice is uh, crops like garlic 
that we are seeing my in my picture here, um, will begin to send up garlic scapes if they're uh, a hard neck garlic, and they uh, will begin to form their bulbs. So the growth we were trying to get, hopefully everyone had good growth, got their garlic uh, mulch off early enough to uh, get some good growth there, and now uh, now they begin to form bulbs. And the uh, lower daylight onions, the more onions that are grown in the northern climates, as we do, uh, will also begin to, to switch over from vegetative growth to making bulbs. So yes, past the summer solstice, time to focus on uh, plant care and pest maintenance. Talk a little bit about that in the slideshow. Uh, also, uh, what kinds of things can still be planted? Hopefully most of the garden is in, but there are a few things we can still do. And then what kind of things might we want to do succession planting on to have additional harvests? So the other big thing right now is uh, water or our lack of water. Um, typically uh, around the state or right now around the state we're down about four inches or more in, in uh, southern and coastal areas. Noticing after a threat finally getting over outside our place right now. Um, and on an average garden needs gardens need about three quarters of an inch to one inch of rainfall per week. Um, and, and if mother nature doesn't uh, um, comply with uh, supplying that for us, uh, we're going to need to do some kind of additional watering. And uh, hand watering is fine in a small enough garden where you can get around and do that effectively. Uh, drip irrigation is probably the most efficient delivery system for uh, irrigation since it tends to put the water right near the roots of the crop where we need it. And uh, we tend to get less evaporation from drip irrigation. But in some spaces, overhead watering, this is a pulsating sprinkler we have set up in our garden, um, is sometimes more advantageous for new seeds or new transplanted crops in that uh, the drip a lot of times will uh, water deeply into the roots, but doesn't water the full surface of the soil. And of course, mulching will help maintain the moisture within the, within the soil. So there are three different kinds of, of uh, moisture in the soil, just quickly. One would be what we call gravitational water, which is when uh, rain falls like now, if uh, enough rain falls, you can almost picture picking up a sponge and uh, the sponge can no longer hold any more water and the water drips out from the bottom of it. That's kind of the gravitational water. In the soil what happens is it would run off the surface or the groundwater would uh, run somewhere where it would go into a river, stream, uh, pond, or so on. Capillary action is another type of soil water, and capillary action is interesting. It, again, using the sponge analogy, if you think of a sponge and, uh, that's, that's somewhat moist, and you put it in a bowl of water where the level of the water is below the top of the sponge, the sponge will actually soak the water up into itself. And that's what happens in the soil as well. Even though during the day the, soil, the surface of the soil can dry out, if there's water underneath, that uh, capillary action will help to draw the water back up to the surface of the soil. Plants don't necessarily only get water from the surface of the soil, but uh, it is one way that they can, that moisture moves around and they can get water. And then the third type is what we call hydroscopic water on this, but Basically, think of it as a thin film of water around each soil particle that the plant can't access. But without it, rainfall is too, has too much friction to seep into the water. So it tends to run off. And if your garden is getting the bit of rain like I'm seeing right now, 
uh, that rain, if your garden is super dried out from uh, all these days of hot, sunny weather, the, the moisture may not seep in very well. And if you go out after the rain um, and stick your finger into the ground and you see that it's really only gone a quarter of an inch or so into the ground, then your soil has lost that hygroscopic water. And you'll need to add additional water if we don't get rain in order to build that back up. So at this point, what could still be planted in the garden? Well, uh, lettuce and greens, which I'll talk a little bit more uh, in a minute. Um, carrots, it's a good time of year to plant carrots. We usually wait until around now to plant our uh, fall storage carrots because we're, we don't really want a uh, monster-sized root to store for the winter. So our early plantings of carrots, we tend to eat during the summer season and um, enjoy in salads or, or as fresh carrots. And then we usually grow a, a different variety for fall storage uh, that um, we plant just about this time of year. Uh, the brassica family, sometimes we call it, they're actually the crucifer family. And the brassicas, which are the broccolis, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, uh, are um, crucifer family plants that arose out of Europe primarily. And they're all very similar uh, in how they grow. Um, there are some parts of Europe where there are uh, brassica plants of the different uh, brassicas, the broccolis, the cauliflowers, they'll all have slightly, uh, the wild ones will have different features similar to each. But anyway, um, broccoli, cauliflower, and, and the shorter season cabbages, not necessarily the big um, storage cabbages, but the smaller, smaller head, heading cabbages are uh, a good thing to put in at this time of year. I know a lot of times um, in the past I planted those in the early spring and they will grow well, but they typically um, will reach their maturity in the heat of the summer. And particularly with broccoli and cauliflower, when the crop is maturing into the heat of the summer, particularly the full-headed varieties, they can go by really quickly because they're, they're not really a heat-loving plant. And so uh, you need to keep on top of them if you, uh, if you do have some that are beginning to head up this time of year. And if, uh, if you'd like to try some now, I found that uh, they mature into the uh, cool weather of the fall and hold much better. And oftentimes the heads will get much bigger in the fall. Uh, summer squashes, zucchinis, cucumbers are also something that can still be put in this time of year. Often in our field plantings on our farm, we would do a, another planting of squash and cucumber separate from our spring planted ones because of uh, disease remediation. Uh, there was, isn't a whole lot that organic gardeners can do to hold off some of the diseases of squashes and cucumbers like uh, powdery mildew. And so having them planted in a separate area so they have good vigorous growth again, um, generally extends the harvest season of squash and cucumber. Um, and we generally at that point let our uh, summer plantings uh, go by or we even take them out to plant something else. A couple other things we like in the fall, we often do a late planting of peas just to have another harvest of those. Um, and then scallions, we're planting scallions almost every time of the year. We do love our onions, but having the green onions to harvest um, into the fall and fall scallions will often overwinter and be another early thing to be able to harvest in the spring. Spinach, we have planted all season long, um, spring, summer, 
the heat of the summer is not very um, easy for for spinach to either germinate or to grow very well. It will often bolt, which means it'll start to go to seed before it's really made enough of a plant. So I generally now hold off on planting more spinach until um, mid-August or so, again, so that the spinach is maturing into the cooler part of the season. Dave, a quick question about broccoli. If you were planting that now, would you plant from seed or seedling? Um, I would always suggest starting uh, the plants indoors and then transplanting them out. It takes about four to six weeks for a seedling to get going on broccoli. So it's a, a lot of care for a tiny plant, plus uh, flea beetles that I'll talk about in a few minutes can attack the broccoli seeded outdoors. So if you do seed outdoors, and, and uh, folks do, uh, definitely cover it with a row cover to keep the flea beetles off. And the row cover is uh, often called a floating row cover. You can see in the image that I have up now. Um, the, these are uh, crucifer greens or mustard greens, arugula, mustard, kales that we grow for our salad mixes or salad greens. And we, the, the group in the back of this shot uh, we've already harvested we haven't pulled them up yet uh, but they're beginning to get that flea beetle damage and then our new batch is covered with the fabric row cover and we'll just move our way down the bed uh, planting the uh, mustard greens into small sections of this bed covering with the row cover and then when we finish this bed, we'll often rotate that area to keep planting salad greens into the late summer and fall. We'll rotate, rotate that into our lettuce beds. So we grow the lettuce separate from the mustard type greens because they're different plant families and they're subject to different insects. And if we were to replant the salad greens, the mustards into this same bed, the flea beetles would be in the soil. And even though we covered them, they would emerge out of the soil and still eat the greens. So rotating to that other bed where we didn't have mustard greens helps to alleviate that issue. So we plant lettuce and salad greens. Oh, every two to three weeks as the season goes on because we love our salads in the summer. A brassica family or mustard family. So again, need to be careful where you successively plant radishes, uh, keeping them away from other mustards or uh, other areas that may have had the brassicas in them. But again, radishes are very short season, uh, very nice. I especially like to get them in the fall uh, when some of the summer salad ingredients are kind of petering out. It's nice to have some color, something colorful to go in the salad. Beets are also quite quick and uh, beet greens grow quite quickly as well. So we do successive plantings of those. Spinach, I've already mentioned. And bush beans. If you're growing a pole bean, which is probably the better way to go in a small garden, you've got an extended harvest of beans. Um, we also like to can and uh, have beans uh, fresh and easy to pick. And when we were uh, farming commercially, we planted bush beans about every two weeks so that we were always picking on a flush of the new beans and not going back to pick the older ones. So bush beans can be uh, planted, as I said, every, we did it every couple of weeks, but every, uh, every three, four weeks during the um, height of the summer for uh, new fresh beans. Dave, um, one other question has come in. Um, just wondering about planting from seed or transplants for you sort of all of the plants that you just mentioned? Sure, good question. So uh, lettuce and salad greens, radish, beets, spinach, and bush beans, I would plant all of those from seed. 
I wouldn't try to transplant those ones. Um, I would definitely, the salad greens and radi radishes, as I said, cover them with a row cover, but they all germinate really quickly and grow quite quickly. Uh, so no need to transplant any of those. Good question. Uh, weeds. So often we think of pests uh, as insects, but pests are actually weeds, insects, and diseases. And <laughs> at least in our garden this week, um, some uh, wild turkeys that got into our lettuce. So now's the time to control your weeds. Um, hopefully the garden is in, uh, not a whole lot more planting or transplanting to do. And uh, controlling weeds is, is really important this time of year. Uh, you want the weeds get ahead of your garden plants. And we used to sometimes uh, get so busy that we would uh, neglect to get in some areas and get them weeded and you'd send uh, or you'd go in to weed that area and it was actually hard to find the onion plants or the carrot uh, seedlings or something. So uh, saving them from the weeds we would call heroic weeding. Um, we don't want to do heroic weeding because number one, it's, it's hard work. Um, and often the plants get stunted by the weeds getting to that size, and so our yield is reduced by that. Another thing to keep in mind is keeping the weeds from going to seed, and the old adage is one year of weeds equals 10 years, one year of seeds equals 10 years of weeds. And that's because weeds aren't like the garden uh, seeds that we purchase. If you look on your garden packets, generally there's a germination rate and we like to see it up in the 90% or so. Whereas with garden weeds, they only will um, germinate about half of the seeds that fall into the ground. It's kind of their um, evolutionary trait to make sure that, the, that they survive. And so, um, that's why it will take sometimes uh, 10 years for weeds that drop in one year to uh, fully germinate and, and come up in the soil. So a couple of things that we're doing in our garden, um, these are some of our onions. Obviously we haven't gotten all the weeds out, but we've gone in a couple of times quickly with hand hose. Um, we really like uh, action hose or they're sometimes called hula hose because they're fast to work through the ground. They don't go deeply so they're not bringing new weed seeds up but we've gone through and knocked out some of the bigger weeds in between the rows and now just going to take some time to get in there and, and weed the individual weeds out in between the plants primarily to try things try to keep things from going to seed. Two, two quick questions came in, Dave. Um, one person asking about row cover, um, just what, what, that sub, what that product is, and someone just asking specifically about dates for sowing cabbage, if you could just mention that again. Mm -hmm. um, so dates for sowing cabbage, uh, I typically, if I'm doing a big, what they used to call a Danish ball head, which is a big storage cabbage. They'll sometimes be, oh, six to 10 or 12 pounds on a head. If you like to make sauerkraut, that's a very efficient way to large head. Some that uh, in our commercial sales, most folks buying a head of cabbage at the store only want a four to six pound head at the most uh, because they're generally not making sauerkraut. They're generally using it for coleslaw or, um, something for dinner where they aren't, they don't really need that much at a time. So for the big Danish ball heads, we would seed them back in late March or early April, transplant them out into the garden in late April or early May, and uh, harvest them late summer. But for the smaller heads, uh, the, the, the three to six pound kind of heads that you'll see in the catalogs of red or purple cabbage, really about up till the first middle of the, or 
the end of the first week of July is about the last date that I would uh, I would seed those. And usually there's enough time there. As I said, they're they're uh, ripening into the cool of the spring or school of fall. Sorry, uh, so that they uh, they don't go by or or crack quite as easily as as they are early spring planted. The row covers. Um, I'll show some other pictures with some row covers later on. Um, generally, a lot of people refer to them as Rime but uh, that company is no longer making row covers. So most folks are buying what's called an Agrabond row cover, and they come in different weights. Uh, the lightest that I am aware of is, is a 15, which are used by seed companies in the summer to cover plants to exclude pollinators where they want to do their own hand pollinating for variety selection. And the Agrabond 15 or AG15 is light enough that the plants don't overheat underneath them. The most common one folks use is the AG19, um, which is available uh, from, not so much from garden centers, but definitely from a number of catalog sources um, and from uh, some greenhouse uh, companies. And then there are heavier weights as well. 21 is one that I've used that we use for covering what, like garlic over the winter where we want some uh, real cold protection. So what those row covers do is they're a spun bound polyethylene. So they're not like a solid piece of plastic that doesn't let air or water through. The spun binding the air to through the plastic and uh, often they're light enough that you don't need a hoop for them but I'll show you some hoops in a, in a minute that help hold them off of the off of the plants and they do a couple of things they help to warm up the plant to, to protect them during the cooler part of the season they keep them from being as wind blown damaged and uh, they uh, will protect them from insects. So they exclude small insects from being able to get in and damage the plant. So finishing up a bit on mulches, or we're talking a bit about mulches. Uh, this is a picture actually that Hillary sent me of some tomatoes and cucumbers in a leaf mulch. And if you have leaves that fall in your yard. Uh, it actually is uh, something we've done in the past where we collect them and store them somewhere either in uh, uh, some kind of hoop covering or uh, even the, the plastic bags and then we bring them back out and use them as mulch uh, either for the uh, fall. Uh, we do a lot of our mulching in our beds for the fall with leaves or actually in the garden during the during the summertime. So basically what you're doing is covering the soil to try and keep light from, uh, from the weed seeds from, from receiving light. And as long as they don't get the light, they typically won't germinate. So when you mulch, you want to make sure that you're covering the ground pretty thickly and pretty completely. Because if you can see the soil through the mulch, then the, plant, the weed seeds are, act, are able to get light. So mulches can be uh, from a number of uh, sources. Um, synthetic mulches are made of plastic. There are some, time, some types that uh, are considered or sold as a biodegradable mulch. Unfortunately, only about half of the synthetic mulch that are sold as biodegradable are non uh, petroleum based uh, or, or plant based. And so uh, MAFCA doesn't allow the bio based mulches to be used in certified, uncertified organic farms uh, because we're still concerned about the amount of synthetic uh, petroleum products in the bio based mulch that will end up in the soil. <clears throat> 
Um, so you can use a plastic mulch on a certified organic farm, but they need to be removed at the end of the season. Uh, another type would be paper, and there are actually paper mulches, like the black plastic mulches that are made in rolls and can be put on the soil, or newspapers can, and then there are the plant-based mulches like hay, straw, leaves, and grass clippings. Grass clippings, I would uh, be a little careful of putting the, wheat, the grass clippings right up against the base of your plants since the grass clippings are fresh generally. They haven't dried out, so there's a possibil possibility of mold, and you don't really want that up against the uh, plants themselves. They do make a nice mulch on the pathways, though. So this is some of our more extensive gardens from a number of years ago where we mulched uh, basically all the pathways and uh, these uh, the middle right bed there is parsley, uh, middle left bed is uh, basil, and I believe to the left of that is celery, and then there's some uh, fennel. This was a fairly large area of, of herbs that we were doing. And they're mulched right across the whole, the whole area um, with the hay mulch. We luckily had our own fields so we could cut our own mulch and cut it at the correct time so we weren't too worried about bringing weed seeds into the garden. But that is one thing that you can get with using mulch. Hey Dave, I have a couple questions that have come in. Mm -hmm. um, one person is wondering about mulching with wood shavings. Mm -hmm. And the second question is about row cover. Um, somebody says that they have some over hoops held down with rocks, so the seal isn't tight and she's getting flea beetles. Does she need to do something differently for a tighter seal? Yes. Um, so yes, for uh, flea beetles, definitely you need to, um, what we would do is bury the edges of the mulch. Uh, so dig a trench and actually lay the edge of the row cover into the soil and bury it with soil so that it's sealed all the way around. Flea beetles are really tiny and uh, any little bit of uh, cover that blows up, they'll find their way in there and, uh, and it, it won't be effective, unfortunately. Um, it's interesting, we also would, often we would use our newest row covers that didn't have holes in them for flea beetle exclusion. And then often go use those same covers in another year for cucumber beetle exclusion because the cucumber beetles are a little bigger and don't seem to be quite as good into the covers. So even if there was a small hole or two, they still seem to work pretty well. Um, wood chips or um, sawdust, the, the, they're further along on the, the carbon scale. So uh, hay mulch is probably uh, the lighter of the carbons. I don't remember offhand the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the different ones, but um, I believe wood chips are somewhere around 50 to 1. Uh, 50 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. And by the time you get up to wood chips, they're about 300 parts uh, carbon to one part nitrogen. So they, the good thing about them is they take a long time to break down. So they can be very good on paths if you have permanent paths. But mixing them into the beds uh, can cause a lockup of nitrogen in the soil. And what happens is uh, the microorganisms <coughs> are going to want to try and break down any kind of organic material. So they're going to be working on this hay mulch or they're going to be working on the straw mulch. And for every bit of carbon that they're finding in the soil, they're going to need a certain amount of nitrogen to break them down. And since the carbon to nitrogen ratio on the wood chips are so high that that 
uh, carbon that the microorganisms are using, or the nitrogen the microorganisms are using to break down the carbon will often tie up that nitrogen so that in the soil so that plants don't have them. So I would uh, suggest uh, making sure that you've done a good job of fertilizing if you're going to wood, use wood chips actually in your garden, garden areas into the beds um, or uh, pulling them off when you're done so that they aren't being turned into the soil as you're putting in new plants. Dave, one final mulch question before you move on. Sorry, uh, Julie's wondering about using seaweed for mulch. Uh, seaweed is a, can be a good mulch. It's also a wonderful compost product. I have not myself used seaweed, but I do know growers that do. Um, it's, you don't need to worry about salinity. Uh, evidently, there's lots of great minerals there, but not an over overabundance of salts, so that's good. Um, the other thing with with typically the seaweed most folks are using are kelp that they rake up off of the beach, and uh, again that can be wet, and you need to worry a little bit about mold and uh, other potential breakdown products from the leaves themselves but they but seaweed can be a good mulch. All right so moving on to plant this is lots of um, some of our older tomato houses not this year but other years and we typically grow an indeterminate tomato which means it's a vining tomato and will continue growing from the tip the growing tip or the uh, apex of the plant. So on the left are plants that are pruned to a single leader or a single top. And on the right is a plant that has been allowed to grow two leaders or two tops. Um, you can do it either way, um, but the advantage of uh, doing this pruning on these indeterminate plants is that uh, you can trellis them, get them up off the ground so that they uh, potentially are subject to fewer diseases and uh, you get a larger tomato. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But uh, typically what we're doing is uh, removing the suckers from the plant as, as it grows. So the plant on the left here, uh, you can see the flower and th those will pollinate hopefully and become uh, our future tomatoes. And typically where you see a flower, and here's the base of another flower on the other plant, we don't have this uh, le oop, leaf stem. So this is the, our leaf, leaf uh, coming off. So here again, the leaf coming off the plant and everywhere that you have a leaf coming off, like here, big one, a sucker. And that's going to pull, so, so we see this fruit bracket coming out here. And this sucker is gonna take energy away from this fruit developing. Now that sucker will also flower and produce fruit but that fruit will be younger than this fruit that was already beginning to flower. So by taking these suckers off, we're allowing the fruits that come to uh, get larger and we're reducing the overall vegetative growth of the plant. Another thing I wanna mention while we're looking at these pictures is that there's a couple of ways to trellis the tomatoes. These are tied up to, a, to an upper um, wire that goes horizontal to the ground. In one case we've attached the string or twine with these uh, tomato clips that can be purchased. And those are handy because they not only hold the plant up but um, 
can be easily be kind of clipped on and uh, taken off at the end of the season. Uh, the other way to do it, which we've been doing when this one, is we wrap the twine around the plant. Now that requires you to be able to un, uh, undo the string from up above the plant every time you want to wind it around. So that's one thing to keep in mind if you're going to do the winding uh, method. So another way to do this um, trellising, so to speak, of tomatoes and peppers is uh, by doing what's called a basket weave. And in this case, uh, we, the tall stakes that you see are, plant, are put into the ground about every two to three plants. We usually grow about three. You weave the, the twine, tie the twine to the stake, and instead of the twine going vertical, it goes horizontal along the bed. I have a better picture in a minute. Uh, but in this case, we had two rows of tomatoes within the bed, and so each row was, um, was, tr was uh, woven with the twine individually. Now, if you're going to use this, you can do it on the indeterminate tomatoes, but really it's designed more for the bushing type or the determinate varieties of tomatoes. And those are typically the ones that uh, don't continue growing from the apex. They will grow, create a bunch of flowers, and then produce a lot of fruit at once. So if you're really into canning and you want a lot of tomatoes all at once, the bush varieties are often good ones to, to use. And on peppers, that will, they will help the, keep the pepper plants from falling over. So these are some of our pepper plants. I just took this picture today. And you can see how the plants have been growing up. We have two uh, strings on them right now. And these stakes are not as tall. The, on the tomatoes, uh, generally those stakes are four foot tall. And the tomatoes don't generally reach the top of the stake before the, they're um, fruiting. But peppers don't get as tall except for the Anaheim varieties. And so these stakes are only about three foot tall. And uh, we'll put on two to four different lines of strings. And as you weave, you want to grow, go around each plant in a different direction. So, whoops, keep hitting the wrong thing. So you can see this string goes behind the plant there and in front of the plant here. So the next one would go behind and so on as you weave your way up. And they're not only weaving around those, they're tied to the stake and then they go uh, around the next plants down the row. One of the things that happens with peppers is, particularly the bell peppers, as the uh, fruits get large, is they get so heavy and if there's enough of a fruit set, uh, especially on some of the newer varieties of peppers, they can weigh the, the plant over so that the, the pepper is exposed to sunlight. Instead of having a nice coverage of foliage, it'll be exposed to sunlight and then it will sun scald. And it'll be a, a little brownish patch that um, looks like some kind of a disease, but it's actually just that it's been sunburned. So this is a good way to hold them up and keep that from happening. Uh, tomato and pepper pests, uh, particularly insects to look out for. These are tomato hornworms and they are so amazing. They're a very large uh, flying moth. They tend to fly at uh, dawn and dusk, not so much during the day, so we don't tend to see them that much. Uh, but they'll lay eggs um, are on the leaf or base of the tomato and pepper plant. These worms will hatch out and they're quite large. They're as, as big as your thumb. They can get to be. And they can do a lot of damage all at once. The good thing about uh, hornworms is that they don't winter over here in Maine. They won't survive our cold winters and so
they uh, need the moths need to be need to fly up or in some case coming up from the own up in, in the in the low pressure cells uh, but typically they don't show up until later in the summer but they if you begin to see defoliation of your tomato or pepper plants then you want to start scouting for these hornworms tomato fruit worm is a little more difficult there also the same insect as the corn earworm and again they won't winter over in our soil here in Maine they have to move up they're also a moth and they'll uh, move up from the south and they will burrow just as they do in corn they'll burrow into the uh, ear of corn they'll burrow into your more into the calyx around the pepper than in tomatoes so another thing to begin to, to scout for, if you see that little hole in the, in the top of the pepper plant. And both of these worms or caterpillars are susceptible to Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a, a organically approved spray made from a bacteria that only affects the Lepidoptria species or the moth and butterfly families. And uh, so they don't damage pollinators, which is one nice thing about them. Uh, Disease-wise, there are many foliar diseases of tomatoes. I'm not even going to go into all the different types. Um, often it's not just one type that you're, you're seeing on tomatoes, but a variety. The best way of controlling tomato diseases honestly is to grow them in in a, under a plastic cover like a hoop house but if you aren't if you don't have that available then um, particularly as soon as the plants get into the ground getting them mulched uh, avoid watering overhead because what happens is those diseases live in the soil they're pretty endemic in our soil and as the rain falls or the or you're doing overhead watering the splashing of the uh, drops of water get onto the lower leaves of the plant they infect the lower leaf and then they work their way up through the vascular system of the plant and uh, slowly kill the leaves so uh, mulching avoiding overhead watering and then as you begin to see uh, spotting or a yellowish decoloration of the lower leaves of the tomatoes uh, you can prune those lower leaves off they aren't going to do you any good at that point and you'll it will help remove the spores that could help to infect other plants or or other parts of the plant So moving on to cucumbers. Uh, cucumbers can be left on the ground just to sprawl, as we say. Uh, they get quite thick. Um, I've had workers that didn't like to pick cucumbers. I actually do kind of like uh, uh, scouring through the cucumbers or the melons. Um, but another way to go about it is to trellis them. And again, uh, we are using clips uh, to, um, to tie them up. Uh, cucumbers do tend to want to climb more than a tomato doesn't want to climb at all but a cucumber will want to climb but they they don't they can't hold on as well as a bean plant can so uh, we do use the clips and the vines also need to be suckered so everywhere you have a leaf uh, you'll have a, a new node of a new plant coming out of there and those are all taken off to, again to create a central leader and then the, the fruits will start down at the bottom the, the earliest flowers and and the fruits will kind of work their way up the plant and uh, they look pretty cool when when their uh, fruits are hanging off the plant in the summertime So plant care for cucumbers, squash, and melons, two of the big ones to look out for, a cucumber beetle, striped cucumber beetle on the left, and squash bug on the right. So cucumber beetles uh, generally winter over here. Uh, they head for leaf trash or um, protected areas around the garden, uh, edge of the woods, they'll hide under leaves, 
Uh, they'll also burrow into any squash or pumpkins that are left out in the field in the fall. So you want to make sure that you collect any uh, debris or till in any debris, compost any debris, get up any old um, fruits to get to get, take away their winter winter hiding places. But this is the time of year they're beginning to show up. Uh, Part of the reason we cover our squash and our cucumbers and melons in the early season is that, as you can see, the cucumber beetles on the left are doing a really good job of devouring that leaf. And uh, they will um, kill small seedlings pretty quickly if they're left uncovered or unprotected. Um, we found out uh, from a trip out west, the Native Americans in the southeast, southwestern U.S. were the folks that first started growing the gourd family or squashes. And uh, wild gourds out in the southwest, the, some researchers found that it has to do with the bitterness of the plant. The cucumber beetle is attracted to the bitterness of the plant. But most likely in the wild, the cucumber beetle performed the service of thinning the squash, because if you think of a, all those seeds inside a pumpkin or a squash, they all want to germinate. So rather than them getting too thick, the cucumber beetles actually helped thin them in the wild. But since we plant our squash and cucumbers out in exactly the spacing we want, um, we also don't want cucumber beetles thinning them for us. The squash bugs have become more of a problem in the last few years. Uh, used to be that you'd see a squash bug on one or two plants and they wouldn't multiply that much. Uh, but they're getting to be more and more of a problem and unfortunately they seem to really like living part of the day, the heat of the day, under the black plastic mulch. So sometimes uh, fabric rope, or um, sorry, uh, Landscape fabric type uh, ground covers or pla black plastic can sometimes um, harbor the squash bugs. And the picture also has the uh, eggs of the squash bug. And in this case, someone's doing their job. They're scouting for the eggs uh, here on the bottom side of the leaf. And they're going to either remove the leaf or uh, squish those eggs. And the more of that you can do, the fewer squash bugs you're going to have. A couple of others to worry about. Uh, if you see a plant um, where the whole vine of a squash, in particular, like a winter squash, is uh, wilting, look down along the thicker part of the stalk, and often you'll find this uh, gooey, gluey kind of looking material coming out and the, a browning kind of stalk. This one's an extreme picture. Um, and sometimes if you even slice the, uh, the squash open or the vine open lengthwise, you'll find this borer inside there. They're very hard to control. Again, row covers for as long as you can keep them on. Of course, a row cover on squash, cucumbers, and melons are also going to exclude the pollinators. So one of the things we uh, eventually have to do is uncover the squash and others so that they can pollinate, otherwise we don't get fruits. Uh, powdery mildew is not going to show up in July so much, but it's another one to keep an eye on later in the season, especially with our dry weather. Uh, it, they seem to come on more quickly with, with dry soil, and the, the leaves will show this powdery uh, -ness to the to the leaf itself. There's not a whole lot that can be done for powdery mildew, um, as I was mentioning on summer squash and cucumbers, we would often do a second planting separated from the first planting so the mildew doesn't move over onto them too quickly. So moving on to potatoes. Not a whole lot here, um, but this is the time of year. If you did get them in or early in the season, like uh, middle of May or so, 
Well, you should begin to see the tomato flowers and uh, tomato or <laughs> tomato flower, potato flowers. And potatoes are actually related to tomatoes. They're in the same plant family, the solanacea. And those fruits will produce little uh, uh, tomato looking fruits, like a little tiny cherry tomato looking thing. They're, they're not edible. Um, potato fruits and leaves as well as tomato leaves have a, a toxicity to them. So we want to avoid eating those. But uh, the potato itself, which is growing under the ground, a good thing to do is either to mulch around the plants or to hill up the soil around them to keep the potato tuber itself covered. And the reason for that is, again, we don't want the potato tuber to be exposed a toxic um, chemical within them as well. So th that's generally why we don't eat green potatoes. Um, so hilling potatoes. And then did want to mention that now that these uh, plants are beginning to flower, that's the time when they begin to make their potato, the tubers themselves. And it's an important time to make sure you get water onto the potatoes because you'll get uh, more of a bulk of yield uh, with adequate water. And we want to start scouting for potato beetles. So the adult beetle is the, the, the insect on the left. And again, uh, they lay their eggs on the underside of the leaf, and then they hatch out into this bright orange, uh, soft-bodied, um, pupa that um, will, will uh, devour the potatoes. The potato beetle doesn't eat quite so much, and of course the eggs can't eat, but the, uh, the, the larva will, um, will attack the, the potato. Once they have flowered, they'll take up to 30, even some cases 50% defoliation and still produce a, a pretty good yield of potatoes. So, um, Keeping, keep trying to keep your potatoes as potato bug free, and, uh, at least until they begin to flower, is a really good way to go. Another one that's just shown up this week on our potatoes is this leaf hopper. The leaf hopper is the uh, the actual insect is pictured on the left, and this is magnified hugely. They're uh, a, a light green color. They uh, tend to, to kind of hop um, or uh, jump when you uh, approach the plant or you brush the plant with your hand, hence the name leaf hopper. Uh, and they have a piercing sucking mouth part, so they're sucking the sap from the leaf. And the plants on the left have been heavily infested. It looks like they have a disease, but uh, it's, it's called hopper burn. So those leaves have just, they've been so damaged uh, and the sap within them has been so um, pulled out that they, uh, the leaves are drying up. And uh, uh, at this point, I used to think cucumber or uh, potato beetles were our worst pest for potatoes, but the leaf hopper has really become a, a much worse insect. Uh, there's a, uh, a uh, called Entrust that will work on um, potato beetles and will have some effect on leaf hoppers. Uh, there's another um, insecticide uh, organically approved uh, called uh, Pyganic. It's made from the uh, pyrethrum. Uh, flower or chrysant one of the chrysanthemums pyrethrum uh, they are the ones that are that are strong enough to actually make the pesticide out of are grown in Africa or South America we can't grow them in Maine and produce the a strong enough concentration of the toxin um, it's a very short lived um, pesticide, it will only survive in sunlight for about an hour or so. So it, it isn't a long lasting pesticide, but it, it, is, it will affect and so will the entrust uh, pollinators and other beneficial insects. So uh, 
typically we only use those as very last resorts uh, in organic farming. Flea beetles. I'm getting a lot of questions uh, these days about flea beetles. So on the picture on the left, you can see the damage done by the flea beetle. Sometimes these little tiny black specks are the actual flea beetle. And again, magnified, this is what it looks like. Uh, they will overwinter in the ground. So you want to be careful, as I said earlier, not to plant your uh, crucifer family, the, the cabbage cauliflower, cauliflower, broccolis, Brussels sprouts, kale, or any of the mustards or arugulas in the same area where you had those same things growing last year because most likely the flea beetles will be there. And then other ones move in from other places as the season progresses. So floating row covers, again, are the best defense against these critters. And typically they are the worst in the early part of the, or late part of the spring and early part of the summer. Um, I do find, however, that uh, because we are so dry, it seems like the flea beetles are attacking things even more so because they're looking, they're also looking for moisture. So, um, row covers. Another insect on the uh, crucifers uh, are the cabbage moth, which is pictured on the left, and a cabbage looper, which is the one pictured on the right. Moth is kind of a pretty moth. It does have a, a dot on its wing. This, these wings are closed up so you can't see it very well, but when the wings are open, you can see it. You'll notice these moths do fly in the daytime, and if you have a large enough planting of crucifers, you'll see them kind of flitting around between the plants, and then you know to expect the green worm, um, which is eating the foliage, but often in like a broccoli, you'll cut that head of broccoli and um, maybe steam it or boil it uh, or cook it for dinner and that that will kill the worms and they'll they'll um, arise in your cooking pot which uh, uh, my, I know my family didn't like that too much. <laughs> um, the difference between uh, so then the looper is also a moth it's more of a grayish brownish moth it also flies during the daytime. The main difference between a looper and a, a cabbage worm is that the cabbage worm will have these legs all the way along the, 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 its body itself, whereas the looper has legs at either end, and then it does this little hook or loop as it moves itself along. So those are two to watch out for. And again, because they are uh, caterpillars of the moth family, they are susceptible to the Bacillus thuringiensis I mentioned earlier. And just so we don't have to talk negatively about every insect that comes along in the summertime, this is one of my favorites. We used to love finding this with the kids. The worm of the black swallowtail butterfly is quite beautiful itself. It actually looks quite similar to the um, not gonna, the monarch butterfly moth or, or sorry worm. They're, they all they each have this kind of striations to them, and we would you find these. This is on a this one worm is on a dill plant. Uh, we find them on anything in the uh, carrot family. So carrots dill, cilantro, parsley, celery, those are all in the same plant family. And uh, often this uh, worm is called the parsley worm. But if you collect the, find the parsley worm, you collect them, they usually aren't in so much abundance that they do that much damage. Uh, but we used to collect the, the worm, uh, put it in a jar with air holes in the, in the lid and uh, with some uh, of its food to eat, and over a, a week or so, it spins a cocoon, a swallowtail butterfly emerges, and uh, our kids always loved seeing that happen in the summertime. So one of the one of the beautiful um, insects that we have. So fertilizing this time of year, 
um, I tend to uh, do pretty much most all of my fertilizing in the spring. I like to get the compost on, I like to adjust the pH of the soil, and I try to get a good balanced fertilizer on in the springtime. And uh, in a sense, loading the bed so that uh, the, the crop is, uh, is able to reach that fertilizer throughout the year. And remember, one of the adages of organic farming is to feed the soil and not the, not the crop. So we aren't generally putting on highly soluble fertilizers. We're putting on, even in the case of soybean meal or bone char, we're putting on a, a material that the microorganisms still need to break down. And those can take three weeks or more to become available. So the good thing about those is that if you're fertilizing your ground and you're putting in your seedling, about the time three, four weeks in that it's starting to, to really grow vigorously, it does, some of that fertilizer is, is becoming available and it will break down some more over the summer season. Um, so if you are going to do some fertilizing this time of year, I recommend only applying to crops that will be in the ground for more than four weeks from the point that you're fertilizing. Otherwise, you're not really, uh, the plants aren't really going to be there to utilize that fertilizer. The other thing to be careful of is that uh, crops like the ones pictured here, tomatoes and peppers, are fruiting crops. And fruiting crops don't really want to be too heavily fertilized, particularly with nitrogen, because that will encourage leafy growth rather than good, healthy fruiting growth. Uh, phosphorus is generally the one thought of more for fruiting growth. Uh, and phosphorus really only needs to be applied one time during the year, as long as you're doing it in the adequate amount that you're estimating for the plant growth. So end of July, um, we're just about to approach the beginning of July. So we have a month yet, but I generally think of our gardens as being, and flowers usually are doing really well by then, lots of nice color, but the garden plants are really kind of hitting their peak around that. Uh, onions are getting ready, potatoes are almost ready, um, beans are going like gangbusters, tomatoes are, are growing well. If they're grown outside, you're probably maybe getting your first fruits. Um, Oftentimes we get into late, later into the summer and there's still lots coming out of the garden, but it doesn't necessarily look as beautiful as it does at the end of July. So that used to always be kind of my benchmark was trying to get the weeds all, all uh, pulled that I, as much as I could in July, uh, beds mulched, things weeded and watered, uh, trellises up on the appropriate plants and lots of walking around in the garden. Um, there's an old saying that the best fertilizer is the farmer's footsteps. Well that's because the more the time you spend out there and looking at things, the better you can manage things proactively. And so scouting, looking for pests, looking for potential problems um, is, is a great thing to be doing in July. And we want to enjoy the garden. And if it's going to be at that height at that time of year, what a better time to, uh, to get out and enjoy the garden. Well, I did want to mention a couple things. I know Hillary might put some of these up, but uh, some publications that Mofka has available. You can find um, current and, and archived editions on the Mofka website. And they are uh, publications such as our Main Organic Farmer and Gardener newsletter, which comes out four times a year. It's a benefit of membership and it's a fabulous publication, has all kinds of great information and articles. Uh, and then we have a series of fact sheets and I put in uh, almost the whole uh, 
uh, link for that, but if you look under mafka.org publications fact sheets, that will pop up. And there's a whole variety of things about garden growing, uh, soils, interpreting soil tests, uh, different nutrients and so on uh, on the fact sheets. And then uh, we put out uh, almost weekly, definitely bi-weekly this time of year uh, or bi-monthly, uh, a pest report that talks about what uh, folks are seeing out in the field at that particular time, some things to, to be scouting for, and again, through the past years and kind of look for the different pests that you might be curious about. And this is a great shot of two of our wonderful staff members, Caleb Goosen, Eric Seidman, our crop specialists. Caleb just started with us a couple of years ago and has taken over doing the pest reports. Um, Eric is pretty much retired now, but he's emeritus at Mafka, so he's still around when uh, us new folks are, are stumped as to what we're seeing. So great to have him still there. And I'm happy to answer questions. So the, this is my contact. Uh, it's the Mafka address. As um, Hillary said, I live in Durham, uh, just outside of Freeport. And so I'm now the specialist for farmer programs in the southern part of the state. So um, if you have um, questions, uh, my email is there. And uh, you can get a hold of me that way. Um, you can leave a voicemail on my work number, which is there as well. Happy to answer questions. Um, I, I do get out generally to visit, mostly to visit farms, but I do enjoy visiting gardens as well. Unfortunately, we're not doing a whole lot of visiting right now, but um, uh, certainly photos and uh, email questions work really well as well. So yeah, happy to answer questions. Thanks, Dave. Um, I have a couple of questions that are built up from the last few minutes, and I'll ask those first. And, and I'll also say that folks are welcome to jump in and unmute themselves to ask a question um, once we've gotten through those, or you can continue to put them into the chat box. So the first one I've got, somebody asking about leaf miners specifically. And then sort of as a secondary question, they're seeing small holes in green leafy vegetables and wondering about what might be going on. Hmm. Um, well, for both of those, I would recommend going to the Mafka website for the pest report. Uh, leaf miner, I know, has been covered. Uh, I'm not sure if it was, I think it was covered earlier this spring. Tends to be a uh, pest of the chenopod family, which are the goosefoot family or the spinach, beets, and chard. And what it does is the adult lays an egg, the egg hatches out, and it actually burrows between the two epidural la layers of the leaf. And so that's why it's called a miner, because it's, it's moving its way between those layers of leaf. And it will often leave kind of, of a windy path through the leaf as it, as it um, burrows its way along. They're difficult to control uh, primarily because they are between those layers. So even a spray does not affect them very well. Generally, I have found that those don't generally get to a, um, enough of a level uh, or infestation to really cause that much damage. Um, and there's, there's no, I mean, there is a, a, a tiny worm inside that leaf, but there's, there's no problem with, with eating that, unless you don't like the, un, the unsightly damage. Um, and row covers on some of those things will work pretty well. And again, uh, charred spinach and uh, beets are not something we need to have pollinated, so uh, we don't need the pollinating insects to get into to, to those, so they can be covered. Great, thanks. Um, two questions. First person has heard that fennel shouldn't be planted near near other crops, wondering if that's true. 
and the second person just wondering how thick the mulch that she puts on should be. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing I skipped over your other question earlier. So um, fennel, I've not found fennel to be uh, averse to any other plant or uh, other plants not growing with them. Um, it's a beautiful plant and uh, there is a male and a female to fennel, which I didn't realize until I took some uh, to market one time and somebody said, well, don't you have any of the female plants, which are the ones that create the bigger bulbs? Um, but I didn't realize that that's what, what was happening. Um, so no, I don't think there's, there's an issue with growing fennel with other things. Um, so the second part of the second question there, Hillary, sorry. Just about the thickness, ideal thickness, oh, thickness for mulch. Right. Well, it depends on what you're using. Um, okay, sorry, I should have said then. This person mentioned that they're using salt marsh hay. Okay. Well, that that's a unique product. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the neat things about salt marsh hay that I learned a while ago is that they used to use salt marsh, marsh hay in burning of blueberry fields, which folks may know blueberry fields used to be burned they're an every other year crop so after they would have fruited they would be burned in order to bring on the next uh, next good growth for a harvest in two years uh, but they use the salt marsh hay as part of getting uh, a fire going and the may uh, help fertilize the berries and I had never ever heard that before so salt marsh hay can be a good mulch because it does have those minerals in it. Um, with any mulch, basically you need to get it thick enough that you can't see the ground through it. And one of the difficulties sometimes with cutting long stem hay is that uh, it's hard to get it that thick. It almost needs to be chopped up somewhat smaller. Um, so it depends on how you're harvesting the salt marsh hay. If it's actually being cut and baled, then you can probably get it thick enough. But if you're like cutting it with a scythe and trying to lay it in, you may have a hard time getting it thick enough. And the general question about uh, holes in uh, different vegetable leaves, there. Generally, there are a few general feeders on vegetables, but usually there are certain insects that are specific to certain plant families, um, which is kind of a neat thing because in a sense, there's only around a dozen or so different major plant families that we have in the garden. So once you begin to learn the pests of those 12 or so plant families, uh, you can pretty much know which ones are going to show up on which plants. Um, so it would be helpful specifically to know uh, which plant families or which crops they're showing up on and even better to potentially get a uh, 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 an idea of what the insect is, whether it's a beetle or a worm or a um, uh, a flying insect or something like that uh, it is helpful as well. So hard to say what those might be um, just in general. Thanks, Dave. Um, let's see. I think the next two questions are related. Um, somebody wondering which herbs can be overwintered successfully, wondering about parsley, and then sort of more generally, what can be planted in the fall for spring harvest? Like, can you plant spinach or peas in the fall? Mm -hmm. um, so herbs, uh, most of the um, herbs that we grow. Well, there's two, two families that are uh, cover most of the herb. One is the 
basically the mint family, which is uh, mint, basil, thyme, savory, um, sage, so many of the herbs are actually in the mint family. And most of all of those are pretty hardy. Of course, basil is not hardy at all. Um, we used to joke that you could just whisper frost to a basil plant and it would die. Uh, but oregano, uh, most of the marjorams, thyme, they're all quite hardy. Uh, they may need a, uh, a mulch or some kind of protectant over them in the winter because generally what happens is that uh, once the moisture is, is so frozen in the ground and in the plant, it's actually uh, the drying wind in the winter that will dry them out and kill them. Um, so they just can't, they, they can't pull moisture up at that point to respire. So even though they can take very cold temperatures, they just don't have moisture available and that's when they dry out. So having a little a cover or a mulch or something will, will help those. Uh, rosemary is also in that same family. Um, it will not overwinter in Maine. Um, so generally with rosemary, we grow our rosemary in pots and uh, either bring it out and have it, the pots sitting outside. Sometimes in the past we've, we've uh, put them actually into the garden and then dug them up again, but we kind of got tired of doing that. So we'll keep them in pots for a few years and then take cuttings and start new, new rosemary every couple of years. Um, the other major plant family are the, um, the carrot family. And that's where we have cilantro, parsley, dill, uh, quite a number of those. Um, celery and carrots are both in that family as well. Now parsley is a biennial and, and a lot of the crops in those family are as well. Uh, carrots are actually biennial. So if you're able to successfully keep your carrots over the winter, uh, they will most likely start to go to seed in the spring. Um, parsnips are, are another um, uh, carrot family plant. Um, so parsley can be wintered over. They need to be very heavily mulched and protected. They can also be dug up and brought inside and will survive the winter and actually produce uh, some foliage over the winter, some vegetation. But in the spring, they're going to want to go to seed as well. Uh, so they won't, they won't last too long into the spring. Uh, of uh, rosemary or parsley into the house in the winter is that they often will bring aphids with them into the house. Uh, you may not find aphids on them much in the in the summertime, but aphids will migrate to plants that that they think may overwinter, and those are two that they might move on to. And then when you bring them into the house, you've brought the aphids in with you. Um, the other neat thing about this plant family, the carrot plant family, is they have very small flowers and they do attract uh, a, a number of different beneficial insects that will help control other insects in your garden, such as uh, parasitic wasps and um, hoverflies, which are really cool little insects to see. So, uh, we actually had a cilantro plant that overwintered in our hoop house this winter and it's turned into this massive bush this spring and it's flowering like crazy and we're not pulling it out because um, it's it's such a great uh, beneficial insect attractant. Wow that's so cool. Um, we have a question from Susan what might be eating an entire pepper leaf? Um, could be a few different things. If it's, a, if it's quite a small plant yet, uh, it, it could be a cutworm that's uh, climbing up into the leaf. Generally, we think of cutworms more as cutting off the base of the seedling uh, in the spring but they, once the seedling gets a little bit bigger, they can migrate up and, and chew up the leaves. 
Uh, they generally hide in the soil in the daytime and then only climb up into the leaf at night. So if you haven't been able to find the insect, uh, you could try going out in the evening after dark and uh, with, a, with a flashlight and seeing if you see any small um, green worm up inside the leaf then. Um, it could also be one of the other insects I mentioned, although it's really early for hornworm or um, fruit worm to be showing up. Uh, there are a couple other worms that it could be, but um, it would be helpful to actually see the worm to be able to make the identification. If it is any of those worms or even a cutworm, the Bacillus thuringiensis would, would be a good, um, a good thing to use on them. Hmm. Thanks, Dave. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, you know, by unmuting themselves, this would be a great opportunity for that. Um, I also have, oh yeah, I'm seeing a couple other questions that have come in. Um, Christian's wondering, do you have any recommendations for folks who are wanting to use compost tea? Are there any pros or cons you would mention? Mm -hmm. um, so compost tea is typically made with a good finished compost. You, uh, you don't want to use a compost that still has uh, kind of an off smell to it that hasn't been fully broken down because uh, you, well, you, you could be supplying certain pathogens and bacteria that you don't particularly want on your fruits and vegetables. <clears throat> so a good mature compost. Then typically uh, the way we've done it is rather than just kind of toss the compost into a bucket or, or tub, uh, we use a, either a burlap or uh, an old um, grain sack and we fill that with the compost and then we suspend that in our uh, barrel or tub or bucket, whatever size you're, you're using, um, with a, a string uh, attached so that uh, when we're done soaking the tea bag, so to speak, uh, we can pull it out and uh, and uh, add the the used um, compost back into a compost pile or use it up use it somewhere else in the garden. So what's happened is the the compost has diffused its uh, essences into the water of the of this tea. Uh, it it is a little bit of a fertilizer. Um, compost is typically not a strong fertilizer. We rate the nat uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in a fertilizer with numbers. And so if you look at a fertile bag of fertilizer, you'll often see three numbers, like a 51010 or a 555. And those always correspond to NPK, or nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So the NPK of compost is typically one to one to one. So it's, it's pretty low in nutrients. We think of compost more as a soil conditioner and a sponge to kind of help hold nutrients in the soil. So the compost tea may be a little more concentrated on some of those nutrients because uh, we've in effect uh, pulled the nutrients out of the compost and made them available in generally what's what's in the soil as the soil solution or nutrients from, but they're a little more available. The other thing that folks use compost tea for is kind of as a prophylactic in terms of uh, any diseases or disease spores that may show up on the leaf surface of the plant. So the idea is that there are so many good bacteria and other microorganisms in that compost and then in the tea that when you spray that on the surface 
layer or the surface of the leaf of the plant, you're inoculating the leaf of the plant with all these good bacteria. And so whatever bad ones might show up, like the downy mildew or um, some of the tomato, different tomato diseases, that they can't really get a foothold because so many of these other good bacteria are there competing for the same space. So I often think of it um, as potentially both a bit of a nutrient boost, but also as somewhat of a protectant on the plants themselves. Thanks, Dave. Um, one other question is about, um, about row cover. Um, uh, sorry, let me just find it. Yes. Um, I have some gray Rime row cover. Should that be used for warmth or for shade? Gray. Hmm. Usually they're a white. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the material is. Um, the spun bound fabrics, uh, generally you can kind of see through them. Um, and not in, in terms of like translucence of a clear plastic, but um, more the, the little air holes that, that, are, uh, that are in the fabric. So if you're, if you're looking at that fabric and it, and it seems too solid, um, you may not be getting moisture or enough air through them. And if the plants don't get enough air, they're going to heat up and, and uh, you could actually create uh, too hot a condition under that cover. Um, so it might be worth, uh, before you use that, if you're not sure that it's actually a, a row cover of some type, um, talk to another gardener or um, even bring it to a uh, a farmer, a farmer's market, and ask a grower if if uh, if they know what it is. Um, I'm not familiar with a gray cover. Hmm. Okay, thanks, Dave. So. Well, thank you for the questions. Yeah, absolutely. We're getting lots of lots of thanks in the chat box as well. So thanks so much, Dave, and thanks to everyone for joining us. So take care, everyone.